So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined next by Lindsay German, who is the convener of the Stop the War Coalition. You might be familiar with the Stop the War Coalition. Of course, we're on the 20th anniversary of the largest demonstration in uh, British history, which was organised by Stop the War in response to the invasion of Iraq. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to Lindsay about NATO, specifically in relation to the Green Party's new position on that military alliance. But before we delve into any of that, I just want to say a massive welcome to you, Lindsay. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thanks. And thanks for inviting me, Chris. Um, it's good to be here. Not at all. It's brilliant to have you. So let's start things off relatively straightforwardly. Um, what would you describe as your and Stop the War's criticisms of NATO? Well, to us, and I think to most people on the left, including CND, for example, who's also long had this position, we regard NATO as an offensive military alliance. We think it's been involved in a whole number of uh, wars and uh, uh, confrontations which have actually made the world a more dangerous place, not a, not a safer place. So we don't believe that um, NATO saying that it's, it's acting in humanitarian in a humanitarian way really is borne out by the facts if you look at the facts it was set up shortly after the second world war as, as part of the emerging cold war it was clearly a military alliance which was meant as they said at the time to keep um uh the german germany down the russians out and the americans in that was the aim of of nato's role in europe and it played that role right through the cold war and so just last weekend, the Green Party of England and Wales shifted its policy on NATO. So historically, the Greens have had a position where if there was a Green government, the Green Party would take Britain out of that military alliance. Uh, now their position is somewhat more nuanced. And it says now that the Greens want to uh, see major reforms to NATO. Uh, so uh, they've called for a um, an end to a, a commitment for NATO, for NATO to make a commitment of a no nuclear first use policy uh, for NATO to uphold human rights in its operations and to only act in defensive um, in, in a defensive uh, manner. What do you make of that shift in policy, and what do you make about how realistic it is that that those reforms could be delivered within NATO? Well, from my point of view, I think the shift in policy is regrettable. I remember marching with the Greens on many, many occasions, but particularly when there was the NATO summit in Wales, I think back in 2014, um, where we were clearly there on a NATO, no to NATO platform and, and the Greens very much had this view. So I think it's a, it's a shame that this, this has now been changed. And I have to say, with all respect, to, I'm sure that people are putting this policy for reasons of humanitarian care and concern about what's happening in Ukraine, which is totally understandable. But I have to say that I think the idea that you can somehow impose on NATO that it won't um, use nuclear first use or that it will only be used in defensive operations is simply belies the reality of the situation, which is that it's increasingly being used in aggressive situations. NATO was central to the bombing of uh, the former Yugoslavia in, in 1999. That was a NATO operation, 78 days of bombing of a European country. Um, it was central to the Afghan uh, war. It was central to the bombing of Libya in 2011. So, you know, you've got to look at the record here and the record isn't a good one. And now we have that NATO is, is really changing the whole landscape of Europe militarily with its, you know, you've got now Finland and Sweden who are joining um, who formerly been neutral countries in, in Europe, and there's been pressure on other neutral countries like Ireland to do the same thing. There's a massive increase of arms being produced and also sent to Ukraine and to neighbouring countries. There are lots of NATO troops all across Eastern Europe in all the countries bordering Russia. So I think the idea that somehow this is just going to be doing a humanitarian job just simply it isn't the case. So I guess from your perspective, do you think that essentially 
NATO, the, 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 its raison d'etre, its very reason for being, means that it can't be reformed in the kinds of way that the Greens now are calling for. I think that's exactly right. And I think that if you look at what's happening in Ukraine now, Putin's invasion was absolutely unjustifiable and we opposed it and continue to oppose it um, and have done so for the whole of the of the last year. But this is effectively now a proxy war between NATO on the one hand and Russia on the other hand. And that is something which should frighten us all because the danger of escalation, the danger of a much bigger war, and of course the danger of some sort of nuclear confrontation because Russia has nuclear weapons and also um, NATO has nuclear, well, NATO is a nuclear armed power. It, the, there are three countries in NATO that, has, that have um, nuclear weapons themselves, which is the United States, Britain and France, but there are a whole number of other countries which actually have um, sort of the, na- the nuclear sharing operation, which means that they too are involved in, in holding nuclear weapons. So you mentioned earlier about, you know, shifts in uh, NATO recently. So obviously you've seen uh, sort of Finland and Sweden and others uh, talking about joining um, the alliance. And um, that's come about as a result of, uh, in part, as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think the that invasion has triggered a lot of sort of thinking on the left of politics that's questioned our historic opposition to NATO and our historic opposition to membership of NATO. And that's certainly fed into some of the thinking that's been going on in the Greens. Do you, What do you make of that argument that actually Russia's invasion of Ukraine means that we have to rethink our, our approach and attitudes to NATO? Well, I, I don't really ac- accept the argument. I understand it, of course, and I understand that that for many people, um, they feel that uh, that Russia is a threat to their independence and to, to their countries. And that I totally understand that. But you've got to look at what NATO has done since the end of the Cold War. It's expanded on a massive scale. It's now we now have NATO membership, which is very closely tied to EU membership. In fact, if you want to be a member of the EU, you have to sign up to NATO or being prepared to be a NATO member as well as part of the defence policy. We now have NATO, which um, Gorbachev was promised back in the 80s that NATO would not expand beyond the border of what was then the old East Germany DDR. Um, It's now expanded a thousand miles east of that. And of course, NATO membership is now, NATO members are now right around the edge of of Russia, including effectively Ukraine uh, has been pulled more and more into NATO long before the invasion started, going back a decade or more. And Ukraine is now de, de facto a member of NATO. Really, it's it's so it's it's military defense is so closely aligned with NATO that makes it um, makes it really effectively a part of of uh, NATO. But of course, there's also NATO expansion now in what's called the Indo Pacific, and this is aimed at the supposed threat of China. So China is being more and more encircled by the AUKUS pact, which is going to have nuclear powered submarines in Australia, which isn't a nuclear power. Japan, which is rearming at a a very, very substantial rate uh, in order to um, get new weapons. uh, And of course, it's very, very close to China with very great antagonisms between China and and Japan going back to the Second World War and, and before that. So you're seeing this growing threat of war internationally and the possibility of two major theatres of war, one in Europe, in in Eastern Europe, as we're seeing now, but also another theatre of war in China. And it seems to me NATO is absolutely central to both of those and is an aggressive alliance, not a defensive alliance. So I promise to only keep you for 10 minutes, but I wanted to put two quick final questions to you, if that's okay. Um, The first of them is um, about, I guess, your response and Stop the War's response to the Ukraine war in relation to NATO. So um, Stop the War has faced quite considerable criticism for uh, its 
initial attitude towards uh, the invasion of Ukraine, or rather the run up to the invasion of Ukraine in in saying that, um, you know, NATO expansionism was uh, provoking um, Russian uh, aggression there. How would you respond to that criticism? Well, firstly, we didn't say that NATO expansion was provoking Russian aggression. The Russians are responsible for their own aggression. And I think we should be perfectly clear about that. You can't justify what they did by looking at what other people have done. However, you've also got to say that NATO expansion played a role in what has now happened in Ukraine. And you can't just look at Ukraine as if history started you know, 18 months ago or something with the build-up of of Russian troops on the border. This is a conflict which goes back a long, long way. And NATO have been part of arming uh, countries which border on Russia and doing all sorts of things which um, make the possibility of war more likely. Now, this isn't, as we're always accused, this isn't a Putin talking point. It's not an apology for Putin. I've always opposed um, what Putin has done. I opposed what he did in Chechnya and I've opposed it ever since. And I've never had the view that Russia had anything to do with socialism or anything like that. So I don't I don't have any kind of brief for Putin. But I have to say, when I look at the world and as you said at the beginning, we're on the anniversary of 20 years on this weekend from the war in Iraq. And uh, the truth of the matter is, and lots of mainstream commentators make this point, that Iraq helped to create the situation we're now in with the situation in Ukraine and Russia. That is not to justify any of it, but let's look at the reality. Let's look at 20 years ago. Since then, double the amount of arms spending internationally, nearly $2 trillion spent on arms worldwide. Um, now in in the modern world. Look at what's happening. It used to be that when the US and the UK went to war against Afghanistan, Afghanistan didn't even have an air force. When they went to war against Iraq, they said there were weapons of mass destruction. But the truth is, militarily, it was very, very easy for them to defeat Iraq. Now you have confrontation between major powers and nuclear armed powers. And that's a totally different situation. And I don't think we can absolve our own government and the um, United States government from any responsibility from that, which is why our argument is not that we want to support these these continuing wars. We think that the arming of Ukraine is going to make things worse. And we think that there should be peace talks. Now, that's not ideal, but most wars end in negotiations, and this one will end in negotiations. The real question is how many Ukrainians and Russians die in the process and how much more dangerous it makes the world in the process. And the final question I wanted to put to you then is... um, your position is that you know Britain should not be a member of NATO. What would a defence policy for the UK look like outside of NATO? Well, I think one of the things, and I'm sure many people in the Greens would agree with me about this, that one of the things we should be honest about is Britain is not under attack from anybody. Uh, is, is the simple truth of the matter. We're not about to be invaded. We're not in this situation. And that isn't because we've got a few Trident submarines. It's because actually the way that the world works is by trying to settle differences in a way which is not um, not a military one. If you ask me what security really means in this country, I would say that, and in any country, that people want a decent living standard, they want housing they want health they want that that's that's what security really means to people and our government is increasing the amount that it's spending on arms and decreasing the amount it's spending on education and health and all the other things which would benefit us and I, I just feel you know it's all we, we it, it's, it's like every time you get close to a war people say what would you do you know what would you what would you do the, the new Hitler's about to you know do whatever and the actual truth is What we've done over decades now is to make the international situation more dangerous, to make it more unstable. And then we turn around and say, oh, we've got to spend more weapons to deal with this. No, there has to be a different answer. And if you look at it, interestingly, if you look in the world, this is a major issue for us here in Europe. And, you know, Europe's very, very centrally involved in the Ukraine war, as is the United States. You look at most of the rest of the world, India isn't. India is kind of neutral on it. Latin America, they don't support 
they don't support Putin, but they don't support what NATO is doing either. So it'd be good to have a foreign policy and the and the world system which wasn't based on the small number of major imperialist powers who are constantly pushing towards more military conflict. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Lindsay. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I hope it, it, I'm sure it will provoke a debate, and I hope we can have a friendly debate over these questions. Thanks very much.